Welcome back to MIN 540, Ministry and Culture, module number one. This is lecture two on H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture. Let's get a little bit of background on H. Richard Niebuhr before diving into his Christ and Culture. H. Richard Niebuhr was an American theologian and Christian ethicist who taught at Yale Divinity School for many years. The majority of his written work coming in the middle part of the 20th century. His focus was on Christian ethics, and so he wasn't well known as a theologian, and it's important to set him into his context a little bit so that we can understand the influence that Christ and culture has had in the decades after it was written. Niebuhr has become known as an exponent of American-style neo-orthodoxy, and what I want to do is set that term in its historical context a little bit so that we can see just why his book was so influential. You see, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Protestantism in America, at least, was at something of a crisis. The old mainline liberal denominations, such as the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Congregationalists, and uh, to a certain, to certain extent the Reformed churches, were drifting into a kind of theological opinion of modernism. And if we could characterize modernism, that would be the recognition of the importance of reason, the centrality of the sciences and human experience in understanding and determining knowledge and truth. There was a drift away from the authority of the Word of God, particularly the written authority of the Bible, in its statements about who God is, the creation of the world, its historical accuracy, uh, whether Jesus was fully God and fully human, was Jesus really born of a virgin, did his atonement uh, really cover uh, the sins of the world in a substitutionary way, or perhaps there was another theory of the atonement that was more appropriate and liberal Protestantism, Protestantism across the spectrum of the country in America was really drifting away from the authority of Scripture. Now, one response to that was fundamentalism. Fundamentalism returned to the orthodox teachings of the Christian faith and grounded its authority for those beliefs in the written word of God and said, the Bible says it, I believe it. And so there was a connection between authority the inerrancy and infallibility and the inspiration of the scriptures, and with uh, orthodox Christian doctrine. Now, that puts on the continuum liberal Protestantism on one side and fundamentalism on the other. And if you can imagine the middle of that continuum, neo-orthodoxy falls somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. By combining some existential beliefs based on the readings of Soren Kierkegaard, as well as uh, applying the best of historical critical scholarship to scripture, uh, which was one of the big time directions that the liberal Protestants went. Uh, the neo-Orthodox theologians like Emil Bruner and Ray Richard Niebuhr and his brother Reinhold Niebuhr, at least in America, tried to hold Christian conviction in tension with new discoveries in history and science uh, and sociology and psychology in order to uh, keep Christianity afloat in the 20th century. So in this way, we could say that H. Richard Niebuhr is not expressly evangelical the way we think of ourselves as evangelical, uh, meaning believing in the authority of Scripture as divinely inspired, and also in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ that requires on some level uh, personal conversion, uh, sorrow for sin, and rebirth, uh, new life in Christ, would be hallmarks of evangelical doctrine. So while Niebuhr would certainly affirm uh, the deity of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance of personal conversion to him, uh, he would not necessarily land on the authority of the scriptures as the written word of God. So that might be one thing to keep in mind as we approach his typology. And one way to critique Niebuhr might be to say, where does scripture speak into this question of the relationship between Christ and culture in a way that Niebuhr does not expressly take into account? 
In Christ and Culture, Niebuhr sets up a five-fold typology where he discusses different expressions of the Christian church's response to the surrounding culture. The first is on one end of the continuum, and he calls it the Christ against culture model, which he says, quote, uncompromisingly affirms the sole authority of Christ over the Christian and resolutely rejects the culture's claim to loyalty, end quote. So historical examples of this rejection of the surrounding culture and clinging only to Orthodox Christian doctrine and Christian practice, and I would add Orthodox Christian expressions of community, would be the Benedictine monks uh, of the Middle Ages who separated themselves from uh, their churches and from the wider culture and established not only monasteries, but a whole rule and practice and order for what their daily life would be structured like that was very countercultural in that day. The Mennonites in the Reformation era and on into today uh, separated themselves from the surrounding culture. The Amish are well known for their separation from American cultural life and technology. And at the same time, uh, we also know that Amish children are given a chance to reject that culture, right? They're given the opportunity to go and make reality TV shows where they sow their wild oats and and discover whether or not they want to return uh, to their Amish roots. Stanley Hauerwas is a living theologian in America who, as many would say, represents the Christ against culture model, particularly his rejection of American uh, patriotism and, and cultural uh, loyalty in politics. Another might be the Catholic worker movement, which in Roman Catholicism is a new kind of monasticism that works with the poor and very directly tries to meet the needs of the poorest of the poor. Um, And an exponent of that in the Protestant context would be Shane Claiborne. He's an evangelical who uh, grew up in a Midwestern suburban church um, like many of us and at the same time uh, has found deep affinities for a rejection of the culture, an expression of a new kind of monasticism that identifies with the poor. We'll look more at a couple of these as we get into Module 3 and Alternative Models of Cultural Engagement. But for now, Niebuhr points out that all of these groups necessarily make use of certain aspects of the culture. So they can't reject culture entirely. That's one of the ironies of this position. The Amish, for example, have to farm. They have to employ some means of education. They have to engage with the surrounding culture to sell many of their products and their goods. So while the possession, while the position is necessary, Niebuhr thinks of it as inadequate because it doesn't stand consistent with the rest of scripture. Uh, it may be a kind of prophetic critique of the culture, but it can never fully separate itself from the wider culture. At the other end of the spectrum, we could look at Niebuhr's Christ of culture model, which, in contrast to the Christ against culture model, really immerses itself in culture rather than retreating from it. Niebuhr says of this group, they are Christians not only in the sense that they count themselves believers in the Lord, but also in the sense that they seek to maintain community with all believers. Yet they seem equally at home in the community of culture. So we could think of some examples of Christians who are so immersed in culture that their Christianity is almost not identifiable, or maybe we could say it's inseparable from their cultural position. So Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, uh, is an example of a Christian who was at least nominally a believer in Jesus Christ, and yet Uh, famously removed all of the miraculous elements uh, from his version of the Gospels and uh, wanted a Jesus who was, in fact, just simply a great moral teacher. Schleiermacher, for example, in 19th century Germany, is an example of someone who tried really hard to make Christianity palatable to it's what he called its cultured despisers. So uh, the people who were, who were wealthy, they were elite, and they didn't want anything to do with the morality of Christianity. But in order to try to save the gospel uh, and orthodox Christian belief, Schleiermacher refashioned uh, these Christian beliefs around experience and emotion and tried to make the gospel more palatable uh, to uh, the people of his day.
Uh, similarly, I'll add another famous theologian here, uh, Oprah, uh, came along a little after Niebuhr wrote Christ in Culture, so he didn't include Oprah in his definition of the Christ of Culture model. But here's an example of a public figure who is sometimes seemingly Christian and at the same time open to all sorts of different kinds of beliefs. In fact, it would seem that an Oprah kind of spirituality uh, will be friendly and favorable toward Christianity just so long as that's not a Christianity that tries to exclude the religious beliefs of others. So it's okay to be Christian, and you can be a cultural Christian, you can be engaged in the surrounding culture, but on the Christ of culture model, uh, we lose a grasp of Christian views of sin, grace and law, the Trinity, maybe the deity of Jesus Christ, and also, maybe most importantly, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. That is to say that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you need to believe in him and repent of your sins in order to be saved. On the Christ of culture model, uh, we are in jeopardy of losing some of those orthodox positions of the Christian faith. Next, we have the three mediating positions between the Christ against culture and the Christ of culture model. If you were thinking of this on a continuum, these would be the positions in the middle. And Niebuhr calls all of these Christ above culture. And the first way of thinking about Christ above culture is the synthesis model. The three above culture models stand for the majority opinion of the Christian church throughout the centuries. Niebuhr thinks of this as the church of the center. The vast majority of Christians will adopt one of these three views that seek a kind of both and solution to the problem of culture. So participating in the culture on some level, rejecting certain other aspects of the culture, and overall trying to be Christians who are in the world but not of the world. Some examples of this position are uh, characteristically Roman Catholic. So if you think of Justin Martyr in the earliest centuries of the Christian church when the church was a persecuted minority, Justin Martyr was famous for being a theologian who looked to Greek philosophy and found a lot of consistency in Christian teaching. He looked at Platonic thought and saw God as father, uh, God as spiritual, and the world as physical. Uh, he also saw a principle in Greek philosophy of a logos that ruled over creation and, and, gave, it, and gave it an organizing principle. Uh, later, about a thousand years later, Thomas Aquinas came along, and as the great synthesizer of uh, the Roman Catholic faith in the high Middle Ages, was able to look at Greek philosophy, he was able to look at Jewish philosophy, he was able to look at Muslim philosophy sometimes, also, all of the Greek philosophy, especially Aristotle, and then all of the church fathers along with scripture, and bring all of this into a grand synthesis, using all of our intellect and all of our powers uh, to look at everything in light of the gospel. And today, Roman Catholicism still uh, looks at its role in the world as this above culture way of thinking about the church. In other words, there's the culture that's out there, and Roman Catholicism looks at that and participates in it, and yet invites the whole culture up to a higher level, ethically, morally, intellectually, culturally speaking. And if you are familiar at all with the writings of the popes, uh, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, um, today Pope Francis, many of these Roman Catholic theologians, and the popes have all been theologians for the past uh, several decades, Many of these theologians speak to the culture as those who are aware and culturally connected, but yet they invite the, cu the culture to a higher level in Christ and in the gospel. So on this view, a Christian is a good person who lives within the standards of good culture, but then expects more above and beyond a higher ideal. This is the kind of uh, Christianity that you will get in American public theology. For example, it's why we want our children to be good citizens and we send them to the public schools so they can participate in the society and yet as Christians we expect something higher of them. We expect them to be a moral example. We expect them to follow the rules. So this is a Christ above culture synthesis model in the world but inviting the world to a higher standard. The second mediating position in Niebuhr's models is the Christ above culture paradigm Christ and culture in paradox, or a dualism, in which Niebuhr says 
quote, human culture is corrupt and it includes all human work, not simply the achievements of men outside the church, but also those in it. So this is the idea that sin has corrupted everything. It corrupts our intellect, our emotions, our will. It corrupts everything that humans make, every thought that they think. It, it corrupts our language. Um, and I think that you'll find that in your ministries that many people uh, in the church experience Christian life in this paradox kind of way. Uh, they read Paul in Romans 7 and Galatians 5 where the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and the two are in conflict with one another. Uh, in Romans 7, Paul says famously, the thing that I want to do, I don't do, but the thing that I hate, that's what I do. So Paul finds this kind of uh, law at work in his body where he wants to do what's in God's law, but he doesn't do it and instead obeys this law of sin and flesh. Now, whether or not that's the right reading of, of Paul there, I think that's the experience of many people. Many Christians experience this kind of tension in their, in their own devotional lives, in their own struggle against sin. And two thinkers uh, or theologians who really uh, experienced this personally, uh, you could look at the writings of Martin Luther or Soren Kierkegaard as Christian theologians or thinkers who uh, thought about Christian engagement with culture in the same kind of way. For Luther, we have one foot in both worlds. We have one foot in this culture and one foot in the kingdom of God. So there, we're constantly in tension, and it's almost like we're being torn back and forth. Uh, similarly, uh, Kierkegaard experienced this uh, dialectic or this kind of dualism in the same sort of way, uh, constantly feeling torn between one thing and the other. So this dualism... Niebuhr thinks, tends to lead Christians to two things. First, antinomianism. That is to say, Christians will reject the law. Uh, because the law leads to sin and guilt, uh, Christians in the Christ above culture paradox model, they tend to reject the law because it doesn't lead them anywhere. It just leads them to more tension, more conflict, more guilt. And so you get that kind of that free grace or that cheap grace idea in which Christians can tend to sin so that grace may abound, and that's the paradox model. Ironically, uh, it can also lead to cultural conservatism, so that we reject the outside culture, we reject the world in, in many ways, and yet at the same time, because we acknowledge that paradox, we'll still go to the movies, we'll still listen to the music that we like, but we know that we're sinners, and so we're making all kinds of interesting compromises at the same time as we're anti-legalism. Right? And I think you see this a lot in American fundamentalism or even in dispensationalism, where uh, we'll reject certain aspects of the wider culture, but then we will adopt many aspects of the wider culture sort of uncritically, and we'll say, we'll chalk that up to, well, we're sinners, we live in the world, we have to live in the world, uh, so we'll live in this paradox. And because we're antinomian, we know that God's grace covers it all, but we'll retain a kind of cultural conservatism. I hope this makes sense. I'm The last of Niebuhr's mediating positions in Christ and culture is this Christ above culture or Christ transforming culture model. And this will be the most significant and relevant and interesting for the class that we're taking together here for the next six weeks. It also uh, is the most significant model for understanding evangelical responses to the question of Christian engagement with the surrounding culture, really for the past 50 or 60 years. One of the reasons for this is that in each of the previous four models of Christ and culture, Niebuhr provides uh, some historical examples, as we've seen, but he also provides some constructive criticism of each of these views. And when he presents the Christ transforming culture model, he is not very critical. He actually doesn't criticize this view at all, which kind of leads you as a reader of the book to think, okay, well, this is the correct one. This is the most biblical. Uh, this is how Christians should present themselves in the world to transform it, to make it better. Uh, and it's an open question whether Niebuhr intended that to be the case when he wrote his book or not. Uh, but that stands uh, today as one of the most uh, interesting and maybe uh, critical points about the book is that uh, we don't 
think critically about whether we should transform the culture or not. And that'll be a key point for James Davidson Hunter as you go to read his book, To Change the World. Now let's look at the three theological convictions of this model, and I think you'll find them to be very familiar. First, creation is not only the setting for redemption, but the sphere in which God's sovereign ordering work operates. For this, you should think back to uh, the video series that we watched uh, for the life of the world. Very strong on the idea that uh, creation is where God's sovereign ordering work happens, and we participate with him in that. Very open to the surrounding culture. Second point, the fall is moral and personal, but not physical or metaphysical. It does have physical consequences. Let me say a little bit more about this. Uh, the idea here on this model of culture is that sin affects human beings. It affects us morally and personally, but it doesn't f affect um, in a negative way the physical world. So animals are good and nature is good and we should conserve nature and we should treat animals with kindness and respect. We should treat creation with awe and wonder. Um, however, what humans do because sin affects us is there are all kinds of negative ways that humans, because of sin, interact with the physical world. But it's not the physical world's fault, and the physical world is not bad. Third, on this view, we'll take a view of history that holds that to God all things are possible. And in history, we're not merely looking at the course of human events, but rather a dramatic interaction between God and men. Right. Classic examples of this position are Augustine, who wrote The City of God, and Calvin, who, in addition to being a great Reformed theologian and exponent of justification by faith and the gospel, uh, viewed nature as the theater of God's glory. And so the surrounding world is good, and what we're trying to do through the gospel is, as Christians, engage the culture and transform it, transform people through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which will in turn have a positive effect on their relationship with God, but also on their relationship with the world. And Niebuhr gives no explicit criticism of this view, as I mentioned before. So what I've done here is provide for you, hopefully, a summary of Niebuhr's typology that makes sense for you. You can see the two ends of the spectrum with the Christ of culture model on the left and Christ against culture on the right. And we want to characterize each one of these positions. So if we look to the Christ of culture, we could say that its characterization would be that of universalism. Finding truth everywhere truth is present. Uh, maybe we could talk about uh, the Apostle Paul's words of testing everything and holding fast to what is good. The universal tendency of the Christ of culture model will be to um, compromise the gospel for the sake of connection with the wider culture. In the Christ against culture model, by contrast, uh, we withdraw from the culture in order to maintain right Christian doctrine and right Christian practice. Although you can't completely withdraw from the culture, Niebuhr says this is kind of a prophetic position in which, in principle and often in practice, you withdraw, but you can't withdraw completely. And so it's not a practical position to take. In the very middle, we could look at the Christ above culture synthesis model, which is the Roman Catholic view, uh, the most mediating of all the positions in which Christ is the goal of human society and human existence. So we look at every aspect of culture and we say, come up higher here to the standard of the gospel. Then on the right, we could look at the Christ and culture in paradox model or the dualistic view. This is the view of uh, Martin Luther, for example, who says, we as Christians have one foot in both worlds. We've got one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom of God. And as a result, we're going to be making all kinds of compromises all the time. And we don't give up our commitment to orthodox Christian practice or uh, Christian belief, but we recognize that sin infects everything and affects everything. And as a result, uh, it's always a both and with uh the relationship of the gospel to culture. Lastly, we could look at the Christ transforming culture view, which is probably the most uh, commonly articulated evangelical view. 
that we're going to get out there and we're going to change the culture. We're going to impact the culture for Jesus Christ. Almost every uh, Christian church, almost every Christian nonprofit has some version of this as their mission statement. We're going to transform the culture. We're going to change lives. We're going to make an impact on the culture uh, for Jesus Christ. And the idea there is that is that a personal conversion. It's life change. And we see this on an individual level with people. But also, we see this conversion maybe of the entire society, and that's our hope, that's our dream, uh, that the laws will be changed, that the culture will be changed, that the filmmaking industry will be changed. And we really see that as the goal of Christianity as it meets culture. By way of conclusion, let's return to some of D.A. Carson's final points on H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture. This is again from Carson's book, Christ and Culture Revisited. So four points. First, Carson thinks that biblical non-negotiables, this would be Christian worldview principles here, biblical non-negotiables must control our thinking simultaneously and all the time. We can't reconfigure biblical worldview or the most essential pieces of the Christian faith in some way that seems good to us without losing something vital. So for Carson, this would mean that the Christ of culture model would be ruled out. We cannot compromise these biblical non-negotiables. Second, Carson thinks that we ought to avoid looking for models or patterns of how to relate Christ and culture in Scripture. Instead, we should find what the whole Bible says to this question. So, we're not looking for an artificially constructed or an artificially imposed pattern that we come up with and then we try to justify that or look at it in Scripture. Instead, Carson thinks we need a whole biblical picture of how God's people should relate to the surrounding culture. And you might ask yourself the question, uh, we'll ask that in the next slide actually, of how do I develop a robust biblical view of engaging the surrounding culture? How can I use the Old Testament to inform that? How can I use the Gospels to inform that? How can I use the, the letters of the New Testament to inform that? And then, uh, what practically does that look like? Third point from Carson, culture must be taken, or may best be taken, to refer to those aspects of human life which ignore or oppose God's holy will. Uh, this is the world in the Johannine sense. So, um, John 3.16, of course, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that would be the people in the world, right? But there is also uh, the first John 2 sense of love not the world, or the things in the world, for all that is in the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, uh, that is uh, not from the Father, but it's from the world. So there's the negative sense of the world. And Carson here is thinking of culture as the negative sense or those aspects of human life which ignore or oppose God's holy will. So we have to think about in our definition of culture if we're thinking of the positive or if we're thinking of the negative. Or maybe we're living in a Christ and culture in paradox model where it's both and and they're intermixed and you can't have one without the other. Fourth point, to avoid broad generalizations, questions of Christ and culture should be rooted in concrete historical circumstances. In other words, we don't simply want to come up with a generalized model and then uh, kind of plug in different problems to that model, hypotheticals. We want, and this goes for the whole class, we want as much as possible to be able to root these questions in concrete historical circumstances, and I would add concrete cultural artifacts and cultural texts and cultural trends, like you'll see in, in the Van Hooser book, that we can point to and say, here is where Christianity can engage this concrete cultural artifact in a substantive way. Lastly, I want to lead us into uh, some of your reading for this first module of the course by asking you the question, what do Carter and Stassen have to say about Niebuhr's Christ and culture typology? Where are they most critical? Where do they believe it's valuable? What about your own intuition, your own critical thinking? As I've presented uh, this summary lecture of Niebuhr's typology, uh, what uh, kind of itched at you? What made you think, uh, this is right, I like this particular view, or there's something missing here, I'm not sure I can agree with this. How would you respond to Niebuhr's typology yourself?
Are you gravitating toward one or more of these five views? Maybe none of them sound like good solutions to you and you're thinking your way critically through that. Maybe you would want to articulate some other view or you're, or you're feeling motivated to find some other view that is more uh, faithful that you believe to scripture and to the gospel. So we'll end with this last question. What view of the relationship of the church and culture is more or most faithful to the scriptures and the gospel? Do you feel like you found that in Niebuhr or do you feel like there's something more that must be out there that's, that's uh, truer uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and truer to the calling and the mission of the church as expressed uh, in Paul's letters, for example? So I'll leave you with those questions. Uh, if it sounds open-ended, that's on purpose. I want you to have these questions in your mind as you're engaging these critical pieces on Niebuhr's typology and as you approach your reading uh, for the rest of the week.